We have another panel. Uh, the next panel is uh, one that describes state successes. And I was thinking about this uh, background. This is almost the perfect place to be discussing what is, number one, a very complicated, and number two, likely to be a very controversial set of subjects dealing with greenhouse gas emissions. And the Bipartisan Policy Center is in, in a city where there's partisan gridlock. This is a, a really an extraordinarily good place to be having these discussions. The reason this room is quite full is uh, twofold. Um, in most cases in this town, the question is weather. So a lot of discussion <coughs> about weather. Whether they will do immigration, whether the Congress will do tax reform, whether this, whether that. That's not the issue here. You just saw the EPA administrator and you've heard the president. The weather's answered. The answer is yes. The question <coughs> now is how. How will it be done? And there's considerable uncertainty around that, and that is what would require a crowd to gather when it's being discussed. But it's not the case that this is the first page of uh, the novel of how this gets done, because there's been work in this area being done in the states for a long, long time, and uh, we've gathered three state officials here today uh, in states that are doing a lot of really interesting work in the issue of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, we have uh, Gene Fox, uh, the commissioner from the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities down at the far end. Um, we have Greg White, the commissioner of the Michigan Public Service Commission in the center. And um, then we have Libby Jacobs, the chair of the Iowa Utilities Board. Uh, you have uh, extensive resumes on all of them, sufficient to say that they've spent a great deal of time in public service, have very accomplished uh, uh, careers, and I uh, hope you'll get a chance to read that as well. So let me start. I, I, it was very interesting <coughs> to, to, to sit and listen. Uh, to Jason uh, ask questions and when it was like 30 minutes in before the two words uh, uh, federally enforceable were used. Up until that time it was, I, I got the feeling it was like tourism, you know, but, but this is going to be a controversial area and I think Jason asked a lot of really important questions of uh, both Gina and Colette. Let me ask a question for the panel and the, the question is the obvious one. Um, what are your hopes for uh, the EPA rule when it's done? W w what are you expecting in, in line with uh, particularly the things that you have done in all three of the states? I'll start, I'll start with that. Um, I think, first of all, thank you to all of you for being here today. Thank you to the BPC for your uh, continuing dialogue on this very important topic. And a special thank you to the EPA uh, I have really appreciated the listening sessions and the outreach that they've done. Uh, they've done a lot out in our neck of the woods in the Midwest. As I know they've done all around the country, and I really think that we do need to take time and thank them. We know it's unprecedented for um, some federal agencies to do that kind of outreach, so I do want to make that point. What am I looking for? Well, I come from a state whose state motto is, our liberties we prize and our rights we will maintain. <laughs> so if you have any sense of the federal state yin and yang that's going on there, I think that kind of sums it up fairly, fairly easily. Um, what we're hoping for is flexibility. It's you know, understanding that, as we heard just uh, from Gina and Colette's conversation, that every state approaches this differently. Every state is somewhere different on the continuum and we have to have the flexibility to acknowledge that. The other piece that's important to us, I think, is time. Just because these are measures <coughs> and standards that are going to be set at the federal level doesn't mean at the blink of an eye we can get everything approved at the state level. All of you know how slow it takes to get things through a legislative process. If there's a rulemaking involved, that's a guaranteed short-term, the fastest route we can get to rulemaking in Iowa is a minimum of nine to 10 months. So those are the kinds of things, legislatively, we're a part-time legislature. Uh, it just depends if it's an election year or not, what's gonna be taken up. So for me, it's the flexibility, but also the understanding that timing is going to be critical for each of the states. If there are things that we have to implement that are going to require changes in either rules at our level or in our state statutory code. I wanna mention it as well before I call on Greg. If you have uh, some questions, write them on a card and uh, make sure you raise your hand and someone will come to gather them because I want uh, this panel to have a lot of questions from the audience. You have questions. 
Thank you, Senator. Uh, you know, I'd also like to echo the uh, thank you to the Bipartisan Policy Center for convening this forum uh, and, and to the EPA for the listening sessions, which we've been very actively engaged in. Um, and we'll continue to go uh, forward as uh, further comments will suggest. The proof is in the pudding, and we're waiting for the details to see you know, how things will go forward. But uh, along the lines of what both uh, Colette Honorable said and then Libby Jacobs, you know, we're, we're very uh, focused on the need for flexibility, uh, allowing the states to develop the, st the SIP plans uh, the SIPs with extended uh, compliance deadlines is necessary. There needs to be a recognition <coughs> that uh, not everybody's coming from the same place, uh, not every state. I, I would like to think that, that Michigan is fairly well positioned. We've actually been <coughs> doing some of this work uh, ten, 10 or more years ago, uh, started to really seriously look and consider things such as greenhouse gases put into place some various programs, uh, energy optimization, renewable energy programs that we find uh, have been tremendously successful. But we also have an, an aging uh, generation fleet. Uh, it's recently been recognized in Michigan, uh, in the Midwest, that Michigan is potentially going to be capacity short uh, around the time that these rules are expected to go into place. And so the challenges are still significant. And so, uh, you know, again, Recognition that not everybody's uh, starting in the same place and developing and allowing the flexibility for us to develop the plans, uh, perhaps you know something along the lines of a three-year uh, horizon for developing the SIPs, uh, I think would be tremendously helpful. Uh, so I think you're going to see a consistent theme over the course of the day on these issues. All right, Jean. I'm from New Jersey, so it's a little bit different. We have 50 different states and. I've been active in NARIC for over 10 years. Clearly, we need flexibility. I know Gina McCarthy from when we negotiated the Reggie agreements. I was an environmental academic regulator. She was the environmental regulator. And I know that, and she's demonstrated, I think, for her time in Washington, uh, that she knows where the states are coming from. And she knows the difference. She used to come to NARIC meetings as an assistant administrator and have small meetings with us uh, to talk, us about these, talk to us about these issues. I th I, so I'm most concerned about my sister states and, and the impact on them. On the other hand, I took this job over 12 years ago because of climate change. I was an uh, economic regulator for 10 years, an environmental regulator for 10 years, and I took this job 12 years ago for climate change. So I'm really happy with how EPA is working on this, working closely with the states. We need that flexibility. In a state like New Jersey, actually the whole Northeast, New England, uh, Mid-Atlantic states, for 20 years now, we've been cutting back on in different emissions, uh, which if you cut back on NOx or SOx or mercury or anything, you're impacting other emissions in many different ways. And in fact, I, I don't think New Jersey will have much of an impact because of this rule, because we have already dramatically cut back. PJM has their MAT standards, I'm told, that are five coal, remaining coal plants, which are already about as clean as a coal plant can be, based on our requirements, based on the requirements of, of the Clean Air Act. Uh, will be shut down over a certain period of time because of the PGM standards. We have, luckily, half of, half of our electricity capacity is nuclear. I'm expecting, hopeful, that the, most of that will, will, will remain for quite a while. And the administration, the Christie administration, is, is pushing hard for some new natural gas plants. We already have two. I also know that about 2% of our electricity capacity is already solar. Uh, our legislature in 07 passed a uh, Global Warming Response Act mandating a 20% reduction uh, of uh, carbon uh, by 2020 because of the economic decline in 08, now it's at 17%, but also requiring by 2050 an 80% reduction. Uh, so New Jersey is pretty far along, and it's been done over the last, I don't know how many years, uh, in bipartisan fashion. Tom Kane, Republican governor, yeah. Christy Whitman, Republican So, governor. So all three of these states are states that uh, have taken early action, and it leads to the question, uh, what do you think is going to happen with respect to early action and the credit for early action in the rule? And what would you like to see happen? Go ahead. Well, uh, you know, certainly we would like to see recognition there. That's, that's one of, I think, the key tenets of, of where the states are coming from. Um, you know, in, in Michigan, as I mentioned, you know, we, we really started taking a serious look at, uh, in, first in the context of our capacity needs, uh, recognizing our aging uh, generation fleet, 
but also in terms of investment, uh, economic development, uh, you know, of, of a dozen years ago. Um, and, and so we put in place some policies that, as I mentioned, I think are, are tremendously successful uh, since 2000, well, from 2005 to 2011, we reduced our, our greenhouse gas emissions by over 15 percent. Uh, our, the programs we have in place, both renewable portfolio standard and energy efficiency, which we call energy optimization, uh, have a compounding effect. So we're seeing uh, additional benefits on an annual basis. We're, we're meeting those standards uh, uh, ahead of time and below budget, if you will, uh, having been involved with the modeling that was done on those standards in, in the 2007 uh, time frame, we anticipated greater costs and a, a much more difficult challenge of reaching these goals. Uh, every every uh, energy provider in our state is in compliance at this time, and we anticipate they all will be uh, when the when the horizon, which is 2015, uh, to meet those standards are in place. So we, we would like to see some recognition for those those projects. I, I want Gene and Libby to answer that question as well, but I, I'd also like to. You implied that you are actually tracking and measuring CO2 reductions from existing programs, is that correct? That's correct. And are you fairly confident of uh, the numbers you come up with and the tracking mechanisms? Well, that's a, that's a uh, controversial yeah. issue. Uh, you know, the, the tools we've been using are actually EPA tools. Um, there has been some question as to, you know, how accurate those are, and I know there's development of additional uh, tools, uh, evaluation, measurement, evaluation uh, tools. Uh, verification tools and uh, you know so so I guess th well, they are up to challenge but but based on what we have available to us we feel confident all right Jean New, New Jersey uh, has been tracking for uh, since I think 1998 all emissions our Department of Environmental Protection puts out quarterly statements of that uh, and which now includes carbon I don't know exactly when we started carbon but it, but it has to be at least eight or ten years now and that's a reachable on our environmental department's website. So we're pretty confident about that. Uh, our, our utilities are, are we restructured? So it's generation, um, although some of the parent companies have generation. And so we're pretty comfortable that, that our tracking is, is, is good. So your tracking is with another department as well, outside of the power sources? Yes. Um, they report the power sources report to them, they work together. Right. Libby? We, Iowa is in the same scenario. The Iowa Utilities Board does not track, but our Iowa Department of Natural Resources does track. <laughs> Um, and started tracking carbon emission, uh, CO2 emissions several years ago. They have it both a uh, specific by utility as well as a statewide perspective, and so those numbers are, are through that department. Um, back to the, uh, the question about early action. Uh, it wouldn't be a forum on uh, EPA or <laughs> Iowa without me mentioning wind. Um, wind is a huge driver in Iowa, and we certainly would anticipate uh, some sort, a lot of credit we would hope for early action. Uh, as an example, back in 2000, we had a little over 237 megawatts of wind in the state. By 2012, we were nearly uh, 5,100, and by next year, we'll have an additional 1,050 megawatts. So we'll have almost 6,100 megawatts of wind. Um, so we certainly would like credit for some of that, because I'm not sure that same kind of growth is, is going to go forward. In the same time, um, the carbon intensity from electrical generation has actually gone down. In 2000, it was about a little over 2,200 pounds. In 2012, it was 1,700. So we certainly are seeing that just the policies that support wind development in Iowa, and they are tremendous. Uh, wind is very bipartisan in Iowa. Uh, everybody embraces it. It uh, doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on. It doesn't matter if you're rural or urban. Uh, you can get everything from an associate degree to a PhD. There are up to 10,000 jobs associated with the industry in the state. So it's as much an economic driver as it is an environmental and energy driver as well. So we certainly would like to have a lot of credit for that, obviously. Senator, if I could just very yes. quickly, uh, I, I want to clarify the, the number that I threw out, which is more than 15 percent. That's, that's from the electric power sector, electric generation sector. So, you know, there's other sectors, obviously, that we're we're tracking as well, but the, the more than 15 percent uh, improvement since 2005, between 2005 to 2011, was in the electric generation sector. So I expect some early action from EPA just because 
Many, many states have been taking actions over the last 10, 10 or so years. You have the, the West Coast, obviously California is always out in front, but the entire Northeast, the, the Reggie states, and then some uh, in the Midwest as well. So, so I exp the question is how and how they're going to count it, and that's very tricky, as, as both Gina and Colette were discussing before. And all, of, all three of you are members of NARUC, right? That's correct. And so uh, we have three states represented on this stage, all of whom have taken some very significant, you've been boasting about wind here, with justifiably, all of us in the northern Great Plains have been aspiring to, uh, to get to where Iowa was. And we, in North Dakota, we have a lot of wind in right. North Dakota. I think, I think we're the Saudi Arabia of wind, by yes. the way. <laughs> all, we're born leaning to the northwest against the prevailing wind. But um, in, in, in circumstances where you, you have that much early investment, uh, if the EPA would decide we've got to develop a baseline that is somewhat reasonable, and that reasonableness means that we're not going to give credit for all of the work that's been done, uh, what is that going to do to uh, uh, individual states or to uh, regional cooperation, do you think? with respect to the EPA rule? Well, we'd be sorely disappointed. That's a, you know, I think it goes without saying. Um, but I think the, the, you bring up regional um, cooperation, and I think that's another key to some of the success that could possibly happen. Uh, a lot of the states have been talking. We've talked informally. We, there are all sorts of meetings that are going on, either with our own environmental uh, air quality folks or with the economic utility regulator side hoping that we can try to come up with some sort of a regional approach. And, and when we've heard from the EPA, they've talked that regional is certainly something that's in, on the radar. You know, who knows what will be in the, the final regs that are proposed. But the more we can talk and about this issue regionally, I think the better off we'll all be. Uh, let's assume that it's not you three here representing these three states, but you're at a NARUC uh, meeting and all 50 states are there. Uh, Tell us what, what the mosaic is like there in terms of, are, are there some states that say, what issue, what's, what's the deal here? What, what, we don't quite understand what the issue is with respect to carbon. Have we been doing anything? No, not really. I mean, we don't, we don't expect all this to happen. Are there, are there some states in that position? And if so, what, what, how significant is that? Yeah, the, there are, but I, I think almost all of them see uh, clean energy technologies, wind, for instance, uh, as something that's economically beneficial. It creates mm -hmm. jobs, it's good for the economy. It's, and, and clean air isn't just a carbon issue. There's other issues with people, public health, and the environmental impacts. So there are definitely, or definitely colleagues uh, who I admire and like a lot uh, who don't exactly believe, as I do, that, that humans have anything to do uh, with climate change. I think the science is clearly there, like the, the recent UN panel report, the latest one that just came out, I think the fifth. Uh, but some other people have other views on that. On the other hand, they're still working on, for instance, wind in Texas. It's a big issue, uh, and it's a lot of jobs, and it's producing electricity for them. The, the way 111D is written is, is quite interesting, because it, it almost is a blank slate. Uh, and the EPA administrator today, I thought, uh, in response to Jason, was very thoughtful about their interest and willingness to find a way working with NARUC and the individual states to make this a success. Um, the, do, do, is, is it your sense that at the end of the day, uh, most of the states will be working alone or will most of them be involved in some kind of regional coalition? Uh, you were involved uh, with respect to the, the REGI negotiations early on, right? I mean, what's your sense of that? That was really interesting. I was, at that time, I had been an economic regulator for 10 years, and I was an environmental regulator for, at that point, about four or five years. And uh, so far as time, environmental and economic regulators work together. Uh, today, there are a number of economic regulators who were environmental regulators in the states. They're very, very active in NARIC, which is helpful to, to help educate the, other, the others. Um, and and, and I, the regions work together closely. They have at, at NARIC before. We have, I'm in the Mid-Atlantic region, but they all, there are, I think, what, nine different regions? I don't remember. But there's, there's a number of different regions, and they've been working together on a lot of these issues. This is one of the issues that most of those regions are working on, and the EPA is working with them. Is Iowa involved or Michigan involved in yeah, regional it, it, cooperation? Absolutely. Well, you know, first of all, um, in some parts of the country, and, and Michigan is a good example, we're, we are part of regional transmission organizations which you know, recognize that there's a regionality to uh, the, the power system. 
Uh, Michigan is in both the Midwest or Mid-Continent uh, Independent System Operator and the, the PJM uh, RTO. Um, and so we're involved with activities there. But we're also involved with, for example, the Midwest uh, Power Sector Collaborative, uh, which uh, the only criticism I have of that right at the moment is that there's not enough states involved. It, it currently has Michigan, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. We'd love to get Iowa, Indiana, Ohio uh, in there as well. Um, but, but certainly, you know, we're spending a lot of time working with our colleagues uh, and our counterparts in other states to try to see if we can't come up with, with regional solutions. At the same time, I would like to say that it's got to be a combination of both. Uh, we're doing a lot of things in our state. We, we do have to focus on our states. Uh, you know, one of the things that I would like to uh, offer to uh, the EPA is, is they have to recognize that uh, whatever these rules uh, end up doing, they cannot put one region at a disadvantage over another mm -hmm. or one state at a disadvantage as, as has uh, come out in the conversation. Not everybody's coming from the same place, not everybody has the same resource mix. And so there will be challenges along those lines and it's very important that, that those rules recognize that. So I see a combination of efforts that we're ta undertaking at the state level uh, along with the cooperative work at the regional level uh, both within the RTOs and within the uh, air administrators and, and the public utility commissions to try to see if we can't come up with a, with a set of solutions that benefit everybody. And I, I should note that NARIC does have routine meetings for the last couple of years with the, with the uh, NASIA, the state energy officials, but also the state air regulators. Uh, that's done on a fairly regular basis. Now, 111D puts a lot of responsibility in the lap of the, the regulators at the state level, but it also indicates that you, you have a responsibility to uh, coordinate with other state agencies, with the governor. There's a role for the governor. And, uh, it, it, are the governors of the three states here actively involved? Uh, if we had them on this stage, would they be conversant? Uh, I, guess you, I guess there's no... I guess you don't want to answer that the wrong way, do you? Uh, no, now, now that I think that's of it, our boss, but but I don't you really but, yeah, but you get the question. I mean, <laughs> the, the, this is not just about you. It it requires the law requires that you have other, other state agencies and governors involved. And in Iowa, we've been meeting uh, with the governor's office, with the Department of Natural Resources, um, and with our, actually our government relations folks in D.C. on a regular basis. We do uh, every other month conference call, strictly on the topic right now of 111D and how that would impact us. We also have already had, we've had ongoing meetings between the Utilities Board and the Department of Natural Resources regularly, meeting with the environmental air quality folks. Uh, we upped that up a notch, obviously, as the 111D conversations began, and actually had to start with just a transmission and generation 101, um, the concept of what reliability is and how all this works. So we started with that just to build the knowledge, just as Gina was talking about, understanding how reliability is so critical. So we tried to bring a lot of individuals along. Um, I also know that the Midwestern Governors Association has had various conversations on the topic as well. So I think the key players in, in our state are at least at the table together and talking regularly. If I could, uh, it's my understanding that I'm actually a substitute for Governor Snyder who was invited and couldn't, couldn't attend. So absolutely, uh, you know, Governor Granholm uh, put in a lot of the policies that are in place, including our RPS and our uh, energy optimization standard, uh, and, and G uh, Governor Snyder has picked up on those. Uh, and we've been undergoing a review process uh, in 2013, continuing in 2014 with the idea that we'll take a hard look at what we can do to perhaps expand those policies uh, in the 2015 timeframe. Uh, so uh, I absolutely give Governor Granholm, uh, I'm sorry, Governor Snyder a lot of uh, credit for, for recognizing the value uh, of these initiatives and, and seeing them as an opportunity not only for good environmental policy but for good economic policy as well. And while I'm a Democrat and Governor Christie is not, uh, we do have the Global Warming Response Act, which is the law of New Jersey and it's, it is being implemented. Uh, we also have a requirement for at least 30 years to have an energy master plan. The head of the Utility Commission is the chair of that. I did one in 08. Uh, we had a little bit of change in the economy uh, at the end of 08, and I give the government credit for doing the uh, new energy master plan uh, a couple of years ago now, which takes into consideration all that. 
So the energy master plan is a lot, it still has the requirements for, for reductions that's required by the law. He also uh, has just recently put out a proposal for a resiliency bank in New Jersey. Uh, and, and it's being discussed broadly around the state, which would actually, based on the extreme weather events and trying to do microgrids and, and, and focus on critical facilities in the state, starting I think with hospitals and, and, and uh, wastewater water treatment plants. We have a question from the audience. What are the chances that New Jersey will re-engage in Reggie as its, way to, as, its, as, as, as its way to comply with federal guidelines? Um, it's interesting. Uh, New Jersey is a very environmental, bipartisan environmental state. Uh, but after the economic collapse of, of the late, uh, of the recession, the Great Recession, uh, the governor pulled out of Reggie about, we were one of the original states, uh, pulled out about uh, four years ago. Uh, the rationale that he gave was that it wasn't really doing its job. Um, and the, the legislature has been trying to get them, which is democratically uh, controlled, uh, back into Reggie. Uh, I don't see that happening in the near future. All right. Uh, I want to ask about the recent agreement between the EEI, the Edison Electric Institute, and uh, NRDC, um, where they, they talked about uh, new rate designs that would, that would break the link between cost recovery, utility cost recovery, and uh, commodity sales. What's your sense of that? Have you followed it? I was just at a, a meeting uh, where there was a discussion about that. Uh, the world of electricity generation is changing, of energy is changing. Natural gas, thank God, has had a lot to do with that. Uh, but people in, in, in New Jersey and New York with Sandy, Princeton University, Co-op City in New York City, some of the other state universities, Island went off grid with their combined heat and power. Uh, there are inverters now and energy storage that are coming out that let you do that. Part of the governor's energy resiliency bag proposal would in fact have microgrids, still connected for the grid, but what, like Princeton did, they went completely offline, kept the major critical uh, structures going. So that's the type of thing that, that I think is, is people are focusing on, and certainly in New Jersey and in New York is a major focus. Well, I was just going to say, you know, the old adage is, uh, you know, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, we're seeing such a tremendous change in this industry uh, being driven, you know, not only by the resource needs, uh, and resource availability, but also by the technological uh, developments. Uh, you know, Gene mentioned microgrids, and there are so many things that are happening. It, it is, in fact, necessitating that review, uh, taking a hard look at how uh, we incentivize and, and ensure uh, reliability and affordability in the power sector. Um, and so, you know, we're, I, I'm encouraged by the uh, EEI and our DC. Um, initiative uh, and we'll, we'll be engaged in it. Uh, I, you know, I don't want to throw out a, a blanket endorsement, but it's, it's something we think about a lot, we spend a lot of time on, uh, and we'll continue to work on those. All right. And uh, Libby, um, a question from the audience. Iowa has an open docket on distributed generation. Can you speak to the role you see for distributed <laughs> generation in state compliance plans? If I'd answered the last question, I was going to start with that. So thank you for that softball <laughs> question. Yes, we opened up a notice of inquiry in January on distributive generation. Um, and the timing was, was interesting from a couple of reasons. One, we did have an eye on the 111D conversations that were going up. And two, we wanted to try to have all the players in the room, and we really aren't. This isn't just energy and environment. We've, we're bringing in the cities and the counties and the farm bureaus and the developers and everybody under the sun to literally to talk about distributive generation in Iowa. And the thought is that what we want is to be able to help craft policy that makes sense. So if there's a regulatory side to it, if there's a business model side to it, if there's a legislative side to it, we were most concerned, as, as an economic uh, regulator, that there would be patchwork approaches to it. And so we think it's an opportune time, particularly as we look at what may be coming down the line in 111D, to really try to get the whole industry on all levels engaged in a conversation about distributive generation. And we would anticipate, um, we've had one round of comments, anticipate more comments, probably a workshop or two, and then offering up some sort of report that may indicate legislative rulemaking, whatever changes out there. All right. So could I add yes. on, the, on the EEI, 
But they have helped put together the consumer, Critical Consumer uh, Issues Forum. And the meeting that was just at uh, last week in Chicago had maybe 20 utility commissioners, 17 or 18 consumer advocate, and then maybe 20 utility people. And if, can't tell you exactly what we talked about, because, you know, but, but, because it was one of those confidential discussions. On the other hand, working. Well, just, give, just give us a hint. Well, working hard together on distributed energy resources, where we can reach consensus very much like how they did with that, that document they put out, working on a revised document. And what was very exciting was there was a lot of consensus. There was disagreements in some areas. But I was very excited that most of the utilities in, in the room really, they're working on this. They're working with their states on this. I mean, it was really pretty. And it, and it wasn't just New Jersey type of states. I mean, there was like Wyoming there. So. Uh, very diverse group uh, of that completely different uh, types of, of, of people, and, and there was a lot of consensus. If you had your wish, uh, I, I want to use the phrase outside the fence. If you had your wish, uh, would you expect and hope that the EPA rule will allow credit for reductions outside of power production? Yeah. And do you expect that to be the case? What, what are your thoughts? I haven't had the nerve to ask my, my former colleagues at EPA about that, but I would expect that to be the case. Uh, absolutely. That's a, that's a critical component of where we can see reductions. As, as a matter of fact, I mean, the low-hanging fruit is in the energy efficiency uh, side. And, and while, you know, in Michigan, we, in the early years, we, we picked some of that low-hanging fruit, we're now looking very, very hard at some of the multi-year initiatives, some of the deeper investments. And, and uh, it, it, I think it's critical that we look at those areas when we're, when we're talking about. Cal uh, California obviously is doing that. They, they went way beyond Reggie. They learned from Reggie. But also, like uh, carbon capture in, in forests and trees, I mean, they take in the carbon. They hold the carbon. That type of carbon sink, it's called, it's critical. And I assume New Jersey State Implementation Plan that I was involved in had carbon sinks. I know the Energy Master Plan that, that is now in New Jersey has carbon sinks. Those type of things are, are critical in, in retaining carbon as well. Let me ask, do, are there tensions at the state level between those who regulate air uh, and those who regulate power? Because in many areas, they are in different agencies. And I assume those that have been involved in the airshed, the environment, and so on, uh, they've been the people involved in this discussion and question. And now, all of a sudden, uh, you're sort of the kingpins uh, in the Public Utility Commissions and so on on these issues. Does that give rise to tensions? I don't, I, there are always going to be logical tensions just because we each are charged with a different approach to things. But our, um, we've already worked with the uh, Department of Natural Resources, the air quality section. We already have a meeting set up in July once the uh, regs are out to talk about next steps. How do we help with the uh, information that might be needed for the SIP? I mean, it's. You know, I would say our air quality folks are probably a little more <coughs> nervous than we are because they know the task will rest on their shoulders um, more than anything. But at our point, we have good open dialogue at this point. Right. Uh, check with me back at the end of July if we're still singing Kumbaya. But I think at this point, it's a very good and we're all focused on trying to do what's right for our state. And, and if I could just, uh, you know, on the contrary, um, we're working very, very closely with our, our air regulators. Uh, I mentioned the Midwest Power Sector Collaborative. That is a collaborative of, of the air regulators and the public utility uh, commissions as well as some other stakeholders. Uh, and, uh, you know, they were really, uh, the air regulators came to us and said, we need you to be involved in this. Uh, we had only been peripherally involved and, and now we're making sure that we're in attendance at each of the meetings and contributing. As Libby said, we have different jurisdictional statutory requirements. But having been, uh, you, economic regulator on two sides of 10 years of environmental regulation, I can tell you that one of the jobs of an economic regulator and of a governor's office is to make sure the environmental regulators understand the cost implications to businesses and to customers. Uh, I am fairly confident that, that Gina McCarthy understands that uh, because she was hit over the head with that during Reggie negotiations. Uh, so that's the one thing. And governors are very useful in that because they understand the cost implications to customers and, and companies as well. Uh, a, a question from the audience, how specifically, underlined specifically, 
Do you see your role as a regulator changing or expanding under 111D vis-a-vis -vis rate making, agency coordination, resource planning, et cetera? Who wants to answer that specifically? I'll try to be as specific with the unknown as I can. Um, from a uh, conversation, I still say that the, the bulk of this still rests in the hands of the environmental air quality folks. They're the ones who are going to have to come up with the plan. And that relationship will continue to be strong between our two agencies. Um, in terms of from a rate standpoint, we've had in place since 2002 advanced rate making principles, which were first put in for traditional generation and were expanded in 2004 for alternate energy generation which gives the industry the opportunity to come in and get their uh, advanced rate making done before the generation is, is built. And I think that has served us well and will continue to serve us well. I'm not sure that needs to be changed. I don't see a lot of tweaks needed there. So I think from that standpoint, we've been ahead of the curve on, on some of those things. I do think there will be a lot of conversation with the utilities on changing business models, as we talked earlier. And I think Greg mentioned the changes in technology. It's just. The, the flow of how things are going. But I think from our standpoint, we've got some of the regulatory things in place that should help keep those conversations and keep things open that would move along as we look at what the impact might be to the consumer and to the utilities. One, one of the challenges of, of being specific is the fact that we're still defining the question. So uh, as we continue to look, and, and Libby you know, mentioned that some of these uh, mechanisms that we've used in public utility regulation are still working, but we do recognize that it's a dynamic industry and, and that we don't want to sit back and, and wait until it's too late to discover that we're not uh, incentivizing the right investments. And so um, as that's all part of, you know, the, uh, for example, the NRDC EEI initiative is, is to take the time to really try to figure out uh, mm -hmm. what is the right questions and, and how do we then go about answering them. All right. Uh, question from the audience. Um, how should EPA standards for new and modified sources be integrated into Section 111D program, if at all? That's a tricky issue. New sources is a tricky issue. Um, we've had, the, I guess, the Clean Air Act amendments were under George Bush the first. So it's been like almost 20 years or 20 years, I guess. Um, so states like New Jersey. I've had to do state implementation plans over the last 20 years. I was there in the early 90s that took things into consideration because of, not because of carbon, but because of other pollutions that were modeled in the 90s that obviously clearly come from the western coal plants. Uh, acid rain uh, was fixed by a cap and trade program in the early 90s under Bush, uh, and, and it worked, which is why the, uh, the Romney and, and Bataki started a cap and trade Reggie thing uh, uh, 10 years ago. So, it's just, it's a, it's a tricky, tricky issue. Uh, and I, I think that working together, we can get our hands on it. But it's, it's not easy. All right. Another question from the audience. Because wind is intermittent, there is a problem meshing it with central station power units. How do you handle that? Well, Iowa is part of the mid-continent uh, ISO. Uh, I have to say that MISO has done a very fine job of figuring out how to integrate wind into the system. Um, when the newest wind farm comes online next year for Mid-American Energy, 40% of their electric generation will come from wind. And obviously, if Warren Buffett thinks uh, somebody can figure out how to integrate it, 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 it's gone that way. We're mindful of that, though, and that's part of the conversation of our Notice of Inquiry on Distributive Generation is uh, if you continue to grow wind, if you grow solar and, uh, and other sources out there, what do you do and how, how do you manage that? And I don't have the, the magic answer to that. All I can say at this point is, but from our experience with MISO, they've done a very fine job of integrating wind into the system. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's an excellent question and, and one that we perhaps are not giving quite enough focus on. Um, we, we live in a world of markets and how those markets are working, uh, whether or not they're properly valuing various resources is a critical question in this. Uh, and just to throw out a, a simple example, uh, I know uh, Pete Lyons, who's the uh, uh, under, uh, Assistant Secretary of Nuclear Energy uh, recently pointed out that given the economic situation, we could be shutting down as many as 25 percent, as much as 25 percent of our nuclear uh, reactors in the next uh, 10 to 15 years if, if uh, we're going to be losing 
our largest source of, of non-emitting generation, uh, we're going to have a real challenge meeting any of these greenhouse goals. And so uh, we, we need to get the markets right. And, and I think that's you know, such a critical component of the mid-continent uh, ISO and the, and the PGM. And that's a focus that we spend a lot of time on, but we need to spend even more time uh, to ensure that we're not losing uh, some, of the, some of these generating sources that also will, uh, to the question, uh, help support the intermittent resources. So we've got a, uh, you know, a matter of whether it's baseline, whether it's uh, you know, contributing to the mitigation of climate change. Um, we want to make sure that we've got those market rules correct. I agree. Mitigation, wind and solar, depending on where you are, the southwest, there's big solar facilities, are brilliant. DOE says that's the place to do it. But New Jersey has been successful in solar, but it's intermittent. Storage backup, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a small company that DOE is, is piloting, and we gave them some money, startup money in New Jersey, uh, that has a battery that'll be for four to six hours long. For a state <coughs> like New Jersey, where you have high peaks, Maryland, New Jersey, Connecticut, very expensive electricity, high peaks in those summer hours for, uh, for air conditioning. Those type of batteries, which should be online in just a couple of years, would be very, very helpful. And Con Ed has a pilot with this company now for battery in the city. Um, so that's exciting. There are some renewables, like wave action, that is not as intermittent as wind or as solar. And so that's where I'm hopeful that we'll have a little bit more research. There are some companies that are doing it. There's very little DOE money, federal money available for that research. Uh, but there are technologies there that are being practiced in the Atlantic and in the Northwest and overseas on wave action. That's pretty constant. So we really, it's depending on the technologies, and I think we really need to have more monies available for that type of critical research for those renewables that are intermittent and for battery storage. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are ways to firm up uh, wind power in a significant way. Natural and, gas. And, yeah, and also geographic distribution of wind power and other things. So um, if another question from the audience, if the EPA allows flexibility and states choose different options, how can or will states work to prevent gaming or leakage? Uh, leakage. Leakage was the issue on Reggie at the end there, leakage. What's that? Pennsylvania did not join Reggie. It's a coal mm -hmm. state. New Jersey was the leakage state, uh, New Jersey, and, and, uh, and because of Pennsylvania. And so that was a huge topic when uh, Reggie was being negotiated among the, the 10 states. It is, I think it will always be an issue, and you just have to be practical, probably reach compromises on it, and get as close to being fair to each state as possible. Yeah. Let me, you know, I was a state elected official for a, a, a fair amount of time and worked in state capitals. And whenever we saw over the horizon federal rules, proposed federal legislation, and so on. We were always short of breath and didn't sleep well. Because, you know, you just never quite know. So I'd like to ask the three of you, what, what for you is nirvana in terms of what the EPA does? And, and what is the nightmare? Uh, because I assume that uh, you're a little bit short of breath from time to time. This is a really big set of issues delivered to your lap uh, unlike any that have ever been delivered before to public service commissioners in the country. So, so I, I assume you spend a lot of time thinking, what if? And, uh, and you also, because you're from three states that have done some remarkable things uh, in early action, uh, you feel kind of comfortable that the EPA will almost certainly want to recognize that. So tell me about your nirvana moments and your nightmare moments. Well, nightmare first. Yeah, and, and we uh, we concern ourselves, you know, with with resource adequacy, uh, reliability, and, and affordability, uh, and so some of these rules don't necessarily fit neatly into some of the things that we spend a lot of time on. Um, I, I'm an optimist by nature. Uh, I think I've been perhaps beat down a little bit. Um, <laughs> and, and so I am, I am very concerned, uh, you know, for example, I've spent about 25 years of my career working on the nuclear waste side uh, with, without uh, any success at all. Uh, and so really, uh, I, I applaud the EPA uh, for their outreach efforts. They're saying all the right things, um, but I, I am concerned. I'm, I'm waiting for the details. 
uh, and, and just hoping that they will, in fact, give us the flexibility to work within our states, work with our neighboring states, uh, to come up with the plans that will allow us to meet those uh, objectives while uh, you know, still making sure that we're keeping the lights on and, and uh, maintaining that level of affordability that's necessary for our uh, economies, uh, for our citizens' well-being. All right, Libby. Nirvana would be the cruise ship smorgasbord of options that we can choose from and give us the flexibility and pick and choose what best fits state, region, whatever the efforts are. I mean, that would be the, the true Well, the way. cruise ship, the cruise the ship, cruise ship buffet yeah. is whatever you want. <laughs> that's right. Well, right? that's why I said that's Nirvana. Um, the, the nightmare is public utility commissions are the only entities in state government that are statutorily charged with what I call the three-legged stool of reliability, looking out for the consumer, and looking out for the financial viability of the industry, of the utility industry. You, if a company can't afford to keep the lights on, that's not good. If it's too expensive for the consumer, that's not good. If you can't keep the lights on, period, that's not good. And my nightmare is that one, two, or, one or two of those legs gets totally chopped off, and then, then I don't know what we do. I'm fairly optimistic, again, having been an environmental and a utility regulator and knowing uh, Gina pretty well. Uh, I, I, I think that we'll have, the, the details will be there uh, that have to be worked out that we've discussed some of them a little bit. But uh, I, I really am hopeful that we'll get it right. Uh, and, my cons and for instance, with, with the generation, you have s large generating companies, some are utilities, some are, are not. Uh, who have old facilities. Uh, how, I mean, dealt with them at, at an ARIC meeting with, with the EPA people. How are we going to handle that? How are we going to, well, it makes sense that I personally, because carbon doesn't make any differences in my state or your state or another state. It's worldwide, different than the other pollutants. It makes sense that if a, a large generating company, a big national company is in 13 states, if it's cheaper for them to reduce in one state than another state, let them do that, because it's about carbon, which can be anywhere. That, to me, makes the most sense. Uh, and I'm hopeful that the utility generating industry gets it, understands it, and would accept that if EPA goes that way. I don't know if they will. I think they should. I think it's the most cost-effective way to reduce carbon. My, my And I should say, that also augurs towards greater regional cooperation. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. And it makes a lot of sense. There's no reason why we shouldn't do that. But that's kind of a cap-and-trade issue, right? Kind of. But I would do it per company. I don't know if they're heading that way or not. It's been discussed and recommended. My concern, my serious concern is that this is going to be ending up in court forever for small p political reasons or economic reasons for some of these larger companies, which is not good for the world or for this country. All right, we're about out of time, but we have, uh, we're not going to get to all the questions, but you've sent in a lot of questions. Uh, Energy storage. Are there additional policies that states can look to in order to encourage energy storage? Can storage help more than intermittent wind and also help baseload nuclear store nighttime power for peak use? Yes. And it, that, but uh, the, the it's new exciting. technology and storage could be the game changer. It's exciting. It? There, there are, there's this company in New Jersey that has an environmentally friendly battery. The DOE is helping to fund. We gave them startup money to start up initially. Uh, California's got all kinds of things going. I mean, they're requiring energy storage now. Matching storage with renewables make complete sense, right. and it is, it is there. My one regret for the stimulus money is we put a lot of money into, say, smart meters, like a billion dollars or something. Well, we should have put it into energy storage, because right. that is really, to me, almost the holy grail. I, I was going to say the exact same thing. I, I think storage is, of course, the holy grail, and uh, it should be a, a national imperative that we spend as much effort as we possibly can, perhaps some uh, additional leadership at the federal level on, on uh, promoting R&D in that area, because it will solve an awful lot of problems that will help us move to the clean energy economy, uh, and, and even more than uh, nuclear energy, uh, which is a base load 24-7, it will uh, really assist in the more intermittent resources and, and allow them to be uh, following the load much more, much more closely. All right. What opportunities you see? This comes from the audience for large electric buyers or large electricity buyers, large retailers, heavy industry, and so on, to get credit in an 11D framework. Fingers crossed. 
Fingers crossed. Yeah, because I, I, I was at EPA in the 90s under Clinton. There were companies like Johnson & Johnson who were doing that without any mandates back then. And there are a lot of other companies like that. And, and I, I, fairness would be that they would, in fact, uh, do that. There are a lot of utility generators or a standalone who have been doing it for the last 10, 15 years. They should get something for doing that. We, we had another question from the audience about storage. Are there additional policies or incentives that the states can develop uh, to encourage energy storage? I, I would concur with just more R&D money at, at this point, I think, to try to find something that is feasible, workable, at a reasonable cost. I hear a lot of people saying they're looking to Germany because of their policies, thinking they may be the ones who can get it figured out. But I think we need to figure it out nationally as well. New Jersey has energy, the administration has proposed out for energy storage, I don't know, was it 20 or $40 million for projects to come in? We've been doing that for a number of years. Uh, we're very hopeful because, again, because of Sandy and extreme weather events, uh, people are looking for that. All right, from the audience, uh, comment and proposals by MISO, RTO Council, recommending grid-centric approach to cutting emissions. Does this usurp state authorities? Yes, but go ahead. No, it's, <laughs> it, it's part of the mix. And, you know, uh, as everybody knows, we're balancing is, is what's critical. And so I, I tried to emphasize that in earlier comments that it has to be this combination approach. Uh, we do have responsibilities for our own states, and it's critical that we be given the ability to address issues that are uh, specific to our states. However, uh, we live in a, a, a global community, uh, and, and you, know, you can't uh, necessarily put borders up, uh, and, and we don't want to do that. So there, there are tremendous opportunities at the regional level. Uh, we should try to capitalize on, uh, on those to the extent possible while ensuring that we're not then precluding uh, really good alternatives and options at the state level and at the local levels. All right. And uh, last question. Uh, very interested in Commissioner Fox's recognition of the, com of the benefits of combined heat and power in ensuring reliability. How will this feed into compliance with the 111D? I think it fits. I mean, in New Jersey, bipartisan basis, we're working on microgrid uh, and, and, and hopefully being approved by the federal government with the Resiliency Bank. It's tied into to the, to the, uh, uh, the extreme weather events and all that. But, but I think that's the way to go, especially in addition to the extreme weather. You add in cybersecurity and just basic old tourism uh, on the electric grid system and the distribution system. Uh, you put those two things together. That's the way that we need to move forward is in a smaller scale, still with the grid. You need the grid. But a and and scale. that's a that's a you know excellent example of the previous question where the industrial customers and customers can in fact contribute to this. Uh, you know, Michigan is a manufacturing state, and, and we see tremendous potential in CHP. Uh, we have some, but we don't have nearly as much as, as the potential indicates. It's cost effective. It's efficient. It's clean. There's great opportunity. It's base there. load. We have some CHP in Iowa. We've actually received a grant through the National Governors Association to study the issue further. And our biggest challenge is, is getting the costs aligned. It's just not as economic for the, uh, the manufacturers or the entities that are using it. But it certainly is part of the conversation. It's part of our, our NOI on distributed generation. That is not focused solely on, on solar. It's focused on everything, whether it's biomass, whether it's CHP. So a conversation about CHP needs to be incorporated in all of this. I mean, expensive for the East Coast, like Princeton University, they use the combined heat power as the base load. A buy from the grid if it's cheaper, Otherwise, they use that for base loads. They could go offline. And they have solar. They use that. They, they do the whole marketing economic analysis of what electricity you're using at the time. That's, and that, but New Jersey is a more expensive electricity state. Well, again, having served in the state capital, uh, I know that uh, work in some of these state agencies is, is enormously rewarding because you can actually decide to do things and then measure the relevance of it or the, the effectiveness of it. And following on Colette Honorable's, Honorable's presentation this morning, we wanted to have uh, a panel that is success stories. It, you're, you're, you're now in a, in a city where bad news travels first class and good news is steerage. And we wanted to at least give a little <laughs> bit of, we wanted to give a little attention today to the fact that uh, there are states out there that are, that are doing interesting, unique things. And uh, they will not be surprised by what's happening with respect to the EPA because they're working with the EPA. And in addition to that, for some years, they've been working on their own 
in exactly the right direction. And, and so these are not the only three states, but you know, we certainly commend uh, the folks in Iowa and Michigan and New Jersey, and I appreciate your coming to Washington, D.C. today to be a part of this panel. Thank you very Thank much you. for your Thank presentation. You very much. Thank you. Thank you.